Hello, my name is Penny Cartwright and welcome to the Waltham Forest Early Years webinar on the Early Years Foundation Stage reforms. During this webinar, you will hear about the key changes to the Early Years Foundation Stage reforms, a little bit about the background and the reason behind the changes, also what has stayed the same, but you will also be able to consider what the implications are for your school, for the teachers and practitioners working in your Early Years teams, and the everyday practice. You will also be able to use the information to help you identify the priorities for your individual schools, your early years teams, in order to implement the new framework and to continue to meet the needs of all children. During this webinar, you will be able to choose to pause at given points to help you reflect on the changes and to consider the implications. So a little bit about the historical background. We know there's been a lot of changes over the years with early years, and this has been based on a lot of research um, on the importance of high quality early years education for all children in all types of settings. And so based on this research, uh, many years ago, some local authorities developed their own guidance. And then nationally, there was the national standards for day nurseries, and then in schools and settings, uh, there was the introduction of the desirable learning outcomes. Then there was the curriculum guidance for the foundation stage, and we had an under threes curriculum, birth to three. Then there was the introduction of the special educational needs code of practice. And then back in 2008, this is when the early years foundation stage was introduced. This early years foundation stage curriculum was then revised back in 2012, and with minor changes in 2014 and 2017. There was also the non-statutory guidance, the Development Matters guidance produced in 2012, and this was to support the effective implementation of the um, Early Years Foundation stage. And we also know that over the years, there have been many changes to the way Ofsted inspect schools and settings. So the reason behind the changes was that we know that even though there have been improvements since the introduction of the Early Years Foundation stage, and there have been improvements over recent years, we know there is still more to do. And in particular, about children's communication and language. We know how important children's communication and language is, not just academically, but also for their social and emotional development. So research has shown that there is this word gap, quite a large word gap, between disadvantaged children and their more affluent peers, showing that by the age of three, disadvantaged children are already almost a year and a half behind other children in their language development. And we know those children who struggle with communication language at the age of five um, tend not to go on to reach the expected standard in English when they leave primary school. In addition, the latest profile results that we have nationally for 2019 showed that there were still over 27% of children who did not achieve at least the expected level for all early learning goals for communication language and literacy. We also know that children with language difficulties at reception age are three times more likely to have some kind of mental health problem in adulthood and also more likely to find it hard to get work and employment. In addition, we know the prison population and uh, population of our young offenders institutions, 60% have poor communication and language skills. We know the importance of communication and language on literacy, but we also know the importance of maths and in particular numeracy, not just academically for our school life, but also for everyday life and employment opportunities. So there are two main objectives with the reforms. And the first was to improve outcomes for all children, but particularly focused on our disadvantaged children, those children who are not where they should be, but particularly in their communication and language and also their literacy. The other key objective was really to look at the amount of workload that we expect our teachers and practitioners to do, because we know over recent years too many excellent teachers and practitioners have chosen to leave the profession 
because of the amount of workload pressure on them with the amount of paperwork, in particular their planning and assessment requirements. So they wanted to really look at that and to streamline the workload, to streamline the assessment systems, to reduce workload, to free up teachers to be able to spend more time interacting with children and therefore to improve outcomes for children. So there's a particular focus with the reforms on really focusing on improving communication and language with particular focus on vocabulary. In addition, it is about supporting literacy because we know the direct link between communication and language and literacy and also strengthening the literacy and numeracy outcomes at the end of reception to support that smooth transition into year one to prepare children for year one. The early learning goals have been revised. Uh, they've said they've done this because they believe that the new goals are clearer, they're more specific, and they believe that they will be easier for teachers to make accurate judgments on. And also they've changed the early learning goals. So these now reflect the, the areas that are the strongest predictors of future attainment. So what is changing and when? So we've had the revised statutory framework for the early years foundation stage published last July. And this is to be implemented from September 2021. And that is for all schools, all settings and all childminders. Now, some schools are adopted to be an early adopter school. So for those early adopter schools only, they are using the revised framework from September 2020. And there is also an early years foundation stage profile 2021 handbook. And again, this is to be used only by those early adopter schools this summer 2021. So for everybody else, uh, the revised framework will be in, enforced from September 2021. There is also a new Development Matters non statutory curriculum guidance. Uh, this was published last September, and this is a non statutory guidance to help practitioners and teachers to meet the requirements of the earliest foundation stage effectively uh, from September 21. So this shows really what has stayed the same in the framework. You know, the overarching principles of the early years foundation stage, these four overarching principles are still key in the new framework. Still very important about having quality and consistency. You know, the importance that children, wherever they are, wherever children attend, whatever type of setting, uh, you know, that, that there is high quality education, there is consistency amongst the settings, amongst the different classes in schools to make sure that we are offering the best quality education and care that we can and to ensure that all children make good progress. Still very much the same emphasis on the importance of planning for each and every individual child, really starting with individual children's needs and interests. Again, still partnership working is absolutely a crucial part of the framework, working very closely with parents, but also working closely with other professionals to support children to make the best possible progress that they can. Equality of opportunity is still very key to the document to ensure that every single child is included and supported. The earliest foundation stage framework is an inclusive curriculum. It's an inclusive framework. And the safeguarding and welfare requirements in the early years foundation stage framework have remained the same. How young children learn and develop has stayed the same and the importance of play. The early years foundation stage framework is a play based curriculum. So still very important to make sure that we're providing lots of opportunities for child initiated experiences and activities, as well as adult led and adult guided. The names of the seven areas of learning, we still have the prime areas and the specific areas. There have been no changes to the name. So maths is still maths. Personal, social, emotional is still personal, social, emotional. There have been changes to the content under each of the areas, which I'll come on to later. 
the characteristics of effective teaching and learning are still there in the framework, but again, uh, the content looks a little bit different. And uh, there are some changes to the assessment requirements, but the assessment requirement for children at age two, so the progress check at age two that needs to be completed for two year olds has remained the same. So the key changes are with the learning and development requirements. And in the framework, there are educational programmes for all of the seven areas of learning, and this is what the curriculum should be. So there are changes to the educational program content, and there are also changes to the assessment requirements. So in the revised educational programs, you know, this is what it says in the framework about the educational programs. So the educational programs, these are the types of activities and experiences that we need to be providing for our youngest children as set out under each of the seven areas of learning. And it stresses the importance of all areas interlinking with each other, but also the importance of personal social emotional development and also um, the importance of the prime areas which are communication language, personal, social, emotional and physical development, because these prime areas are absolutely crucial for children to lead healthy and happy lives. So this slide just shows you what the current educational programme is for communication language. And you can see here the current framework has generally a very short description under each of the areas. So with the revised educational programmes for all of the seven areas, there is a lot more detail. There's a lot more detail and content about the types of activities and experiences, what the adult needs to be doing and providing to support children's learning in each of the seven areas. So the next few slides show you the communication language, revised educational content. And you can see here, there's a lot more description. Communication and language is much more of a focus with all of the educational programmes. There's much more focus on the importance of those adult child interactions. They stress the importance of the number, but also the quality of the conversations that children have with adults and that they have with other children in this language rich environment. And they also really stress the importance of focusing on what children are interested in or, in or doing. So repeating what children say, but adding additional vocabulary. There is also emphasis on the importance of books and the importance of sharing a range of books with children on a regular basis. And also using opportunities, a wide range of opportunities for children to embed new words, for example, using story props and different objects to support books, stories, rhymes, poems, etc. And there is also the emphasis on the adult role to support children to model language and for sensitive questioning that actually encourages children to want to communicate with adults. You know, what kind of questions are children being asked? Are they questions that children want to answer? So the emphasis on personal, social, emotional is the importance of this area and how this is so crucial for all areas of learning. It stresses the importance of children feeling happy, safe and secure and developing those warm, strong relationships with adults, which will then support and help children to understand their feelings and to manage their emotions, as well as supporting them to develop confidence, a positive self-esteem and positive attitudes towards learning. And under personal, social, emotional development now, there's additional information on self-care and healthy eating, where currently this is under physical development. So they also stress the importance of that high quality interaction 
there's opportunities for interaction with other children, adults supporting these interactions through their child initiated play as well as other opportunities and to support children to develop their relationships with other children, to develop their friendships so that they learn to work and play together cooperatively. Physical development. Physical development now has a focus on gross motor skills and fine motor skills. And they talk about the links between gross and then later on developing fine motor skills. Also the progression from birth throughout the earliest foundation stage and into reception and beyond. And the importance of providing lots of opportunities, a, a wide variety of different opportunities, indoors and outdoors, supporting all aspects of gross motor skills and then fine motor skills. So making sure that we're providing a whole load of different opportunities to explore using puzzles, small world activities, different tongs, different tools, because we know the more opportunities children have to develop their fine motor skills with a range of tools, then actually this will support them when they come later to, to writing with their hand-eye coordination. Literacy, the focus here is very much on supporting children to develop that love of books. So there's much more of an emphasis on the link between language comprehension and later reading and writing. It emphasises the importance of adults talking with children. So talking with them about you know, the world around them, but also the books that they're sharing with children and the importance of the enjoyment with, with this. Literacy also is including the phonic knowledge and the importance of phonic knowledge, but also the, or the importance of reading and writing, but emphasising the importance of talk before writing. Mathematics. Mathematics, the focus here is much more on a deep understanding of numbers, so really supporting children to have that deep understanding of numbers and the relationships between numbers, you know, so children really understand what five really means or what ten really means. Also, it just emphasises the importance of providing a wide range of opportunities to support children's understanding and experience of, of number in lots of different ways. So with maths, shape, space and measures is still an important part of the curriculum, even though in the reforms, the early learning goal requirement to assess children's attainment under shape, space and measures is, has been removed. It is still important that shape, space and measures are included as part of the curriculum. It also stresses the importance of children developing a positive attitude towards maths, so they want to have a go. So they want to take part in mathematical activities. Understanding the world. This is all about children making sense of their world, their physical world and their community. And they acknowledge the importance of children's personal experiences and that these will vary very much depending on the children. But their own personal experience will influence their understanding in this area. So the focus again is on the importance of books and you know the use of books can't replace first-hand experiences but it can really support to help broaden children's understanding and knowledge of this area. So again there's an emphasis on the use of books but also in terms of communication and language so strengthening language so using this area to really enrich and widen children's vocabulary. And expressive arts and design. So this is about the importance of art and creativity and imagination. And again, the focus is to make sure that children have lots of regular opportunities to engage with the arts, giving them a wide range of different media and materials. So this area is about all aspects of art, so not just paint and glue, but also music, 
and model making and also there is still the emphasis on the importance of communication and language so really developing children's understanding their self-expression a range of vocabulary and also stressing the importance of providing a wide range of experiences and frequency and making sure that we're providing repetition so you may want to take a moment um, just to pause this webinar and to consider what do these changes to these revised educational programs mean for your school and your earliest teams and the everyday practice. So the key changes with the reforms are about the learning and development requirements with the educational programs for each of the seven areas of learning. You know, that is the curriculum, the kinds of activities and experiences we need to be providing children to support their learning and development in each of the seven areas. But also there are changes to the assessment requirements. So with the new assessment requirements for schools, uh, this relates specifically to the changes to the earliest foundation stage profile and the changes to the assessment at the end of the reception year. So because the new framework comes into force from September 2021, this means that the first time teachers will have to make assessments against the, the new early learning goals and with the changes, this will be at the end of June 2022. So there are still 17 early learning goals, but there are now 17 different early learning goals. They look a little bit different as well. They are now separated into three statements. So each early learning goal has three statements. And they say that they've done this so that the descriptions are clearer and they believe that this will support teachers to make more accurate judgments. In the new framework and in the new profile, there are now going to be only two judgments. They have removed the exceeding judgment so from the new profile judgments, teachers will just have to make a judgment against whether the child has reached the expected level. And if they haven't, they are still emerging. When teachers make their judgments, it is still based on the best fit ethos. So it doesn't mean that children have to achieve every little bit of the goal, but it's looking at the whole of the goal. It's not equal mastery. It's just best fit and it's teacher's professional judgment. There will be a lot more training and support provided by Wolf and Forest to support the new profile and the new early learning goals. And there will also be additional exemplification materials which should be available later on in the spring to support teachers in making these judgments. Good level of development remains the same. So this is still calculated in the same way for those children who have reached the expected level for all of the prime areas. So for communication and language, personal, social, emotional and physical, as well as literacy and maths. And the purpose of the earlier foundation stage profile, this still remains the same. So the purpose is to support a smooth transition from reception to year one, to have those conversations with the year one teacher about the individual children so that the year one teacher can plan an appropriate curriculum to meet the needs of those children. In addition, the profile is also to share and inform parents about the children's attainment and their development. Characteristics of effective teaching and learning. There is a change in the expectation. Currently, teachers have to include something about the child's characteristics of effective learning in the profile report. But in the new expectations from June 2022, this is now not a requirement. It says that teachers may choose to provide this. It reminds us in the new handbook that the earliest foundation stage profile is not and should not be used as an accountability measure for schools. There are some changes to moderation. So they have removed the local authority uh, statutory moderation role. And again, they've done that because they believe that will ease teachers' workload. 
The reliability of the profile outcomes are still the responsibility of head teachers and managers. And it is still very important that teachers' judgments are accurate. So moderation is still an expectation, but just not the local authorities visiting the schools to moderate teachers' judgments. So schools will still be expected uh, for teachers to take part in moderation type activities. And that is either in-house moderation, you know, with other teachers in their school, but also other schools. And it's very much stressed that the moderation activities should be a collaborative process, a collaborative process. And they state that it isn't about collecting and recording unnecessary evidence. And this is a message that is coming through very, very strongly and clearly with the changes, with the reforms, uh, not just for assessment at the end of the profile, but also assessment throughout the early years foundation stage. So there is a new profile handbook, which you can look at and it gives you a lot more detail and information about the expectations against the profile and the changes. There are also some frequently asked questions that the DfE have produced answers to. This was published last August and it is definitely useful to download this document to see the answers and it just gives a little bit more information about why they've made the decisions that they've made. So this slide just shows some quotes from the profile handbook, the 2021 handbook, um, and also some questions uh, that the DfE produced answers to. So you can see from the first two paragraphs, just again, the emphasis about teachers not having to record unnecessary evidence. It does state that teachers are expected to be able to articulate how they've made their judgments. You know, it is important for teachers to be able to talk about why they have made whatever judgment they've made about children's attainment, but they, they are not expected to provide proof of this using physical evidence. It does say teachers may find it helpful to record some particular significant achievements and they say in a simple way. So they're saying some physical evidence, so some examples of children's writing or mark making or some photographs, some observations will be uh, useful and, it, and that will support practitioners in backing up their judgments. But the clear message is that multiple sources of written or photographic evidence are not required. So it's a very, very strong message that is coming through time and time again about really thinking about the amount of physical evidence we are expecting teachers and practitioners to provide. OK, the, the last um, sentence at the bottom really is in response to some people's concern about the removal of the exceeding judgment. So the earliest foundation stage framework is still based on starting with individual children's needs and supporting all individual children to move on with their learning. So it is still about supporting those very, very able children. It's not about um, not supporting and not stretching our gifted and talented children. So it says here, teachers will still be expected to continue to identify those more able children and to stretch them. And those conversations with the year one teacher and with parents will include information about children's attainment, including those children who have achieved the expected level, but actually are very, very capable and actually are way above the expected level. But in the new profile expectations, teachers are just not going to be required to record that exceeding judgment and to give that data into the local authority and for the local authority to give that in nationally. OK, so the key changes are with the educational programmes, with the revised content and with changes with the assessment requirements with the assessment at the end of the reception year with the profile with the new early learning goals, and there will be more information and training to follow to support teachers with the changes. And just a reminder that the early learning goals are 
the endpoint measure of what a child should be demonstrating at the end of reception, at the end of the early years foundation stage. And it's very clear that the early learning goals uh, should not be used as the curriculum. And they shouldn't be um, used to limit the, the depth and variety of experiences. Um, it is just the assessment at the end of the reception year. It's the educational programmes that form the base of the curriculum. So just to share with you a little bit more about the early learning goals, uh, there is an emphasis much more on communication and language across all of the early learning goals, because we actually know that the emphasis on communication language is crucial for all children's learning and development. So in terms of the communication language early learning goal, there's much more focus on spoken language and vocabulary acquisition. Under personal social emotional, there is now a new early learning goal on self-regulation and also self-care has moved from physical into personal social emotional. Physical now is just, there's just an early learning goal on gross motor skills and one on fine motor skills. With literacy, there's a stronger emphasis on, again, the importance of vocabulary, but also understanding and how comprehension links with the reading and writing. Maths, there is a focus on the depth of, of number and understanding and the removal of shape, space and measure. So they've now got two early learning goals about number. And understanding the world, they have removed technology and they've linked the early learning goals closer to science, you know, past and present history and geography. And with expressive arts and design, there's more of a focus on communication language and also an emphasis about making sure that we give children a wide variety of tools and materials. I mean, again, with understanding the world, there is also more of an emphasis about language and vocabulary. So, and this slide just shows the current early learning goals on the left hand side and the changes in the reforms on the right hand side. So these are for the prime areas. So you can see here that they're, they're very similar. Um, so, for example, for communication language, there are now only two early learning goals. They've combined listening, attention and understanding. Personal, social and emotional development. Uh, they've got an additional early learning goal on self-regulation. Uh, health and self-care used to be under physical development. That is now under personal, social and emotional development as managing self and physical development now just concentrates on gross motor skills and fine motor skills. So you can see here the early learning goals for the specific areas. So um, there is now an additional early learning goal on comprehension for literacy. Maths no longer includes an early learning goal on shape, space and measures, but now there are the two early learning goals for maths are both around number. Understanding the world, there is no longer an early learning goal on technology, but there is an additional early learning goal on past and present. The world is now known as the natural world. You know, people and communities is now known as people, culture and communities. So, you know, generally the content is very similar, um, but there is more a focus on vocabulary as well as understanding. So with the changes with the early learning goals, you know, this was to reduce teacher workload, but also to streamline the assessment requirements. So what does this mean in practice? Really, they wanted to make sure that we're actually doing what makes the most difference to children, to focus on what's important to children. And they really wanted to encourage teachers to use their professional judgment and to reduce this unnecessary evidence and any unnecessary paperwork and to focus their attention on in interacting with children and improving outcomes. And at this time, you may want to pause this webinar to really reflect on, on why you think this was one of the objectives. So why was one of the objectives to reduce 
teacher and practitioner workload. How much time do teachers currently spend on collecting evidence and paperwork? And what are the current expectations of the Early Years Foundation stage? What does it say about paperwork and excessive paperwork? So this is what the current statutory framework says about assessment at the moment. It clearly states that assessment should not take us away from interaction uh, with children. Um, it shouldn't require excessive paperwork. And it also states that the paperwork that we are doing should be limited to that which is absolutely necessary. So only doing paperwork that is absolutely necessary to promote children's successful learning. So this is what the current framework says. So we know this is a page from the Development Matters documents to support teachers and practitioners. You can see here the highlighted statement at the bottom in blue. It said clearly that these statements should not be used as a tick list or as a checklist. And yet we know this is exactly how these statements have been used and are being used. So with the, the new reforms, Again, you know, they say exactly the same about, you know, we shouldn't be having long breaks from interacting with children and we shouldn't be requiring excessive paperwork. But in addition, they've just kind of gone on a little bit further to say when assessing whether an individual child is at the expected level of development. So whether that's against the early learning goals or whether that's for children at an earlier stage of development, practitioners should draw on their knowledge of the child their own expert professional judgment, and they should not be required to prove this through collection of physical evidence. So this is a message that is coming through very, very loudly and very, very strongly about the um, requirement to have lots and lots of physical evidence. So it's really thinking about whether the evidence that teachers and practitioners are collecting are really being useful and improving children's outcomes. So, with the new framework, we have also got a new development matters. And you can see here from the new development matters and the, the framework, they look very similar and they've done that intentionally. So I'm going to just give you an overview of the revised development matters now. So as I said, it does look very similar. It is non-statutory guidance. So it is there to support teachers and practitioners to implement the Early Years Foundation Stage Framework effectively. But teachers and practitioners can continue to use other documentations and other publications to support them. The new Develop Matters is much shorter than the current Develop Matters. They've, they've made it much simpler, they've made it much shorter, and they absolutely stress that it's not to be used as a tick list. It is not to be used as a tracking tool. It includes an introduction which identifies seven features of effective practice. There is a short section on the characteristics of effective teaching and learning. And this section has different content under the different characteristics. And there is a section for each area of learning and development with communication and language the communication language section being the longest. Each area is not separated into the different aspects. It's not separated into the different early learning goals for each area of learning. There is a little bit of additional information to support children with English and additional language. And in the new developed matters, there are now only three very broad age bands. And it includes statements, the types of things children will be learning, and it also includes some examples of how teachers and practitioners can support this learning. So this is from the introduction in the new Development Matters. Um, and again, you'll see the very, very strong messages coming through that the document, it's not, it's not to be used as a tick list. 
It's not about generating lots of data. It's not to be used as a tracking tool. And it states that actually teachers need to use their professional knowledge to help children make progress. And, you know, it's not necessary to have lots and lots of next steps recorded. Some teachers and practitioners are expected to, to have a next step for every child after every activity or every observation. So it's not about having to record lots of next steps. It will be useful to have some next steps for children and some children will benefit from having more next steps than others. But it's really to use your professional knowledge about how you can help children make progress without the, the need to have lots and lots of next steps recorded. So we can help children make progress without generating unnecessary paperwork. And it talks about um, the guidance can be used as a very helpful tool to help you check that your children are secure in their learning by looking at the earlier stages of learning before you look at their age band. And the other important message is really emphasising that it's much more important to support children to to consolidate their learning and to embed their learning, to make sure their learning is really secure without before rather moving from one step to the next or trying to cover everything. So there are seven features of effective practice in the revised development matters. Um, it covers about the best for every child, so the importance of high quality education for all children, you know, regardless of their special educational need or whether they're pupil premium or English and additional language, etc. So really making sure that we're focusing on providing the highest quality education to support every child to make progress and particularly the disadvantaged children. So it talks about starting with the individual children, so high quality care, starting with individual children's needs and interests, the importance of the responsive, attentive practitioner, helping children to feel safe and secure and settled. We can't separate care and education. The curriculum, you know, big focus on communication and language, but making sure our planning is flexible and we're supporting children to be able to consolidate and to embed their learning so they have lots of opportunities for repetition and practice. Um, it is about assessment and I'm going to share with you the assessment section um, in a minute. Um, it is about their pedagogy, you know, how we best help children to learn, you know, the different approaches to learning, you know, the importance of play, but also the importance of the adult role in guiding children's learning and the important role of the, the enabling stimulating environment indoors and outdoors. It also, um, there's a section on self-regulation and the executive function. And again, the, the, the key role in communication language with this to support children in, in being able to regulate their behavior and their feelings. And also the important role of imaginative play and pretend play to support children's self-regulation. And finally, there is a section on partnership with parents and how this role is so important and we need to continue to work very closely with parents. You know, it's a two-way process for us listening to parents, sharing with parents, working with parents to support children's learning at home. So this is the section on assessment and I wanted to include this just so you can see again, the very, very strong messages that are coming through. So it is important that teachers and practitioners do assess children and assess children very, very quickly when they start in their, in their class. So it is about knowing where children are in their development, having accurate assessments, but knowing very quickly whether children are where they should be in their development or whether actually they're going to need more support. But it's not about lots of data and evidence. So this is the strong message. OK, it also emphasises the importance that actually practitioners do need to have a good understanding about how ch children learn and develop. And they do need to know where children are, but they also need to know where they want children's learning to move on to and how they're going to be able to support that. So they do need accurate assessment. So they do identify which children need extra help as soon as possible. But they say that before assessing children, you know, it's, a, it's useful to think about what you're doing, is it useful? 
So I think it's a good time for everybody to really reflect on their assessment systems, reflect on what assessments we're doing, and to really question whether they are all as useful as they possibly can be, which parts of your assessment are more useful than others. And again, it just reiterates that assessment should not be taking practitioners away from the children for long periods of time. The Development Matters includes a section on the characteristics of effective teaching and learning. So the same headings are used, but there is slightly different content. It's, it's presented in a simpler way. And it's got examples of the types of things children will be learning to do, but also some examples of how we can support this. So here you can see a screenshot of the um, section on the effective characteristics of teaching and learning. So there's just the two columns now rather than the previous three columns in the current development matters. And you can see here, uh, you know, really the overview of what the new development matters 2020 includes. So there is a section for each of the seven areas of learning and development with the longest um, section for communication and language. The beginning of every area includes the educational program description. So the description of the types of activities and experiences that we all need to be providing for our children to support their learning in each of the seven areas. There are now only three broad age bands. So there's a section for under threes, a section for three and four year olds, and a section specifically for children in reception. And it gives examples of the types of things that children will be learning to do under these three broad age bands. There are also examples, some examples, of how we can support this. But as I said earlier, the document is much shorter. So this isn't saying these are all of the things that you should be doing. It's just some examples. There are also some observation checkpoints which includes some questions that practitioners can ask themselves about their children's development. And these are for the primaries only. So this is for communication and language, for personal, social, emotional and physical development, and also just for the under threes and the three and four year old sections. And you will also notice that the new Development Matters does not include the early learning goals. And they've done this intentionally you know, because of the key message to say that actually the early learning goals should not be driving the curriculum. It is the educational programs that should inform the curriculum, the types of activities and experiences we need to be offering children. The early learning goals are just to be used to assess children at the end of reception. And each of the broad age bands are given a different colour. So for the under threes, the blue section, the three and four year olds, a green section and children in reception, the orange. And you can see here how the current development matters compares with the new development matters. So you can see in the current development matters, the, there are many more age bands. In the new development matters, there are just three broad age bands. And this just shows an example from the under three section. So just the two columns, examples of the types of things young children will be learning to do, and also you know, some examples of how practitioners can support this. And you know, the examples are very simple. Uh, they're, they're much shorter than the current developed matters. This is, includes a section from the three and four year old page to support communication language and a lot of emphasis on using a wide range of vocabulary. There are also these observation checkpoints. So just for the prime areas and for the under threes and three and four year olds, every now and again, there's an observation checkpoint with just some questions that teachers and practitioners can ask themselves about the, the children that they're working with and their development. So for example, it says, you know, at around the age of three, can the child shift from one task to another? You know, can the child answer simple why questions and so on? And then there is also a section specifically for reception. So examples of the types of things children in reception will be learning to do 
and again, examples of how to support this. And again, the emphasis is very much on learning new vocabulary. So you might want to choose at this point to pause this webinar and to just reflect and to think about you know, the changes to these assessment requirements, you know, the changes to the early learning goals, the changes to the new developed matters, but also the changes with the assessment principles and much more focus on um, allowing teachers and practitioners to use their professional judgment without having to prove, without having to collect a lot of unnecessary physical evidence. So what will these changes to the assessment requirements mean for your school, for your earliest teams and the everyday practice? There is a very useful YouTube clip um, led by Julian Grenier, who is the main author of the New Development Matters, also with people from Ofsted. So having a conversation about the New Development Matters and the key messages about assessment. And I think it's quite reassuring for uh, everybody to watch this clip because then they can be reassured uh, that Ofsted are on the same page with the expectation of data and the collection of evidence. Ofsted have also produced several podcasts as well. So there is a lot of information uh, out there really just to reinforce the message that the, you know, the changes with the new development matters, with the new expectations on assessment is very much about reducing workload for teachers and not providing unnecessary evidence. So um, there is also a new publication coming soon, and this has been produced by um, a, a, an amalgamation of different earlier sectors, and they are producing an alternative to the new development matters. So this is going to be called Birth to Five Matters, and they say it's guidance by the sector for the sector because they are involving the sector with asking their opinion about the document. So the draft publication is available at the moment, um, but they've consulted with people and they're going to be pro providing another draft in the next few weeks in the hope that this will be finalised by March or April. And it's there for practitioners to use if they find it useful. But this document is a lot more detailed. It contains a lot more information about the theory and research and just more practical information. So it's there for people to use if they find it useful. So really over the next few months, you know, what are your priorities? What are the priorities? What are the key changes? And what are the important messages? So what do we need to do? And when do we need to do this by? And who needs to be involved? Who in the school needs to be involved? You know, the teachers, practitioners, the earliest teams, but also the leadership team. And how are we going to share the changes to parents? And what kind of changes will this mean for our assessment systems and our everyday practice in terms of the amount of evidence that we're collecting, but also our planning? So what implications is there for our assessment, but also our planning and our everyday practice? And we need to come back to actually what's important for children, what is going to make the most difference to our children, and particularly thinking about what is going to make the most difference to our disadvantaged children in order to support them to close those gaps. So following this webinar, it's really for you to think about what are the priorities for your individual school, for your individual earliest teams, the teachers and practitioners, in order to get ready to implement the new framework and to continue the meets of all children, but in particular, disadvantaged children. So where is your starting point? Where do you want to get to? And how are you going to get there? So just a reminder that we've got time uh, because the new framework will be statutory from September. So we've got quite a few months in order for us to get familiar with the new requirements um, as well as the revised development matters. 
Up until September, schools must continue to implement the current Early Years Foundation stage unless you are an early adopter school. And just to remind you that in the EUFS framework, uh, the requirements are what you must do. Where it says should, this is where it says um, this is good practice and we should be implementing these statements. The new early learning goals will be assessed for the first time, not until June 2022. So again, we've got quite a lot of time for teachers to get familiar with the new early learning goals uh, before they have to assess children against them. There is the Early Years Profile Handbook, which gives a lot more information about the early learning goals and the assessment process at the end of reception. And also Waltham Forest will be providing further training, information and support for uh, practitioners to support them with the changes to the requirements, including the Early Years Foundation Stage Profile and the, the new Early Learning Goals. And just to remind you that, uh, you know, the message is very clear that the early learning goals are not the curriculum. They should not be used as the curriculum. They are the assessment point at the end of reception. And the curriculum is very much the educational programs, uh, you know, that are set out to support children's learning in all of the seven areas. And young children learn, the way young children learn hasn't changed. It is still really important to start with the individual needs and interests of the children. The Early Years Foundation Stage Framework is a play-based curriculum. It's still really important to provide a stimulating learning environment indoors and outdoors and providing lots of opportunities for child-led, child-initiated opportunities as well as adult-led, adult-guided experiences. We know the focus is to improve children's communication and language, to improve literacy and mathematical outcomes, particularly numeracy. But we know the importance of all areas of learning and how they interlink with each other. And in particular, we know the importance of personal, social and emotional development for children, but also for our practitioners at this very difficult time. I think it's a good opportunity to celebrate the changes, you know, to, to look at our assessment systems and to really think are they working as effectively as they could be? Are we doing too much paperwork? How can we reduce our paperwork to ease up the requirements to make sure that we can focus on supporting children's outcomes and supporting children with as many high quality interactions as we possibly can? So we really need to just think about what can we do to do what matters and what is going to make the most difference to all of our children but in particular, our disadvantaged children to improve all children's outcomes. And really just to bring us to the end of the webinar, please continue to keep on doing what you know is right for your children. And thank you so much for listening to this webinar and goodbye.